Well, good evening, everybody. I'm going to uh, make a start. Uh, there's a few things I want to say about Parsi Solberg, and in that time, those people that are running a little bit late will be here in time for the lecture. So this, I just want to welcome you very much to tonight's lecture, the fifth of this year's Dean's Lecture Series. Um, we're going to have nearly a full house, and I really thank you all for your support. I would also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land, and I pay respects to elders, elders both past and present of the Kulin Nation. At the, at the conclusion of tonight's lecture, I've asked Professor John Hattie to just move a vote of thanks, and uh, after that I'll in then invite you all to come out into the foyer, and if you'd like to stay for some refreshments, there will be some there. So now it gives me great pleasure indeed <coughs> to introduce Dr Parsi Solberg. Parsi received his Master of Science in Mathematics in 1984 from the University of Turku and a PhD from the University of U Vascula. I've been practicing that in 1996. He also got his teacher's diploma from the University of Helsinki in 1986. His PhD had a title Who Would Help a Teacher? which was a school improvement study. Parsi has a long track record in education and in development. His teaching career started in teacher training school and Department of Teacher Education at the University of Helsinki in 1986. He then moved to the Ministry of Education, the National Board of Education in 1991 to serve as a senior advisor in science education. Head of School Improvement Unit and later as Counselor to the Deputy Director General on Education Policy and Development and on Educational Reform. In 2000, he was invited to take the leadership of the Centre of School Development in the University of Helsinki as an adjunct professor at that university and at the University of Ulu. From the beginning of 2003, he has worked as a senior education specialist in the World Bank in Washington, D.C. He's responsible for education projects and analytic work in Europe and Central Asia. He was working with a number of governments in Europe and Central Asia to help them in, in improving education policies and implementing system-wide education reforms. Since June 2007, he's worked with European Trading Foundation in Torino, Italy, as lead education specialist, providing intellectual service, services to governments, to schools, to leaders to improve their education policies and practice. In his current job as Director General of the National Centre for International Mobility and Co Cooperation, Parsi works with the Finnish Government in promoting internationalisation and tolerance and in promoting creativity and global ethics in Finnish society through mobility and institutional cooperation in education, culture, youth and sport. He's been an active figure in, promo in promoting educational changes in Finland and beyond. He's published several books, such as Cooperative Learning Handbook and Small Group Learning in Mathematics. These were co-authored. He's also published more than 100 articles in journals, research periodicals and magazines around the world. And I think the titles of some of these give you a sense of the breadth and the depth of his work. The Fourth Way of Finland, 2011. Rethinking Accountability in a Knowledge Society, 2010. Creativity and Innovation Through Lifelong Learning, 2009. Should Failing Students Repeat Grade, 2008. Education Policies for Raising Student Learning, The Finnish Approach. And Education Reform for Raising Economic Competitiveness. And of course, his latest book, Finnish Lessons, What Can the World Learn from Education Change in Finland? So before handing over to Parsi, I'd like to make the observation that it in fact it was inevitable that Parsi would become a physicist, a mathematician, an academic, and later a global authority on education matters. It is, as they say, in his genes. Parsi's father was a head of a primary school, his grandfather an engineer, his great-grandfather a professor and head of forestry, his great-great-grandfather a professor in etymology, and his great-great-great-grandfather, a university rector. So he's followed a great line of academic thinkers. Moreover, he enjoys reading, writing, music, basketball, golf, and in particular, his new five-month-old son. It is with great pleasure I welcome Parsi 
to the lectern who will present how Finland remains immune to the global educational reform movement. Could you please welcome Parsi to the lectern? Hello. Good day. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. Good. It's great to see you here all, really. And uh, I want to thank the university and the Graduate School of Education and personally uh, the dean for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Um, I understand that not everybody who wants to speak in the dean's lecture series can do that, so I'm really honored. I'm happy to see Barry McCaw here, an old friend. Um, uh, are there any Finnish people around here? Raise your hand if you're from Finland. Okay, you know, there are two types of people around the world. There are Finns and wannabe Finns. <laughs> Especially after my presentation, you know, many people want to, uh, want to do that. All right, so thanks for this, and I... Um, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, uh, deliberately provocative because this is the academia, this is the university. Nobody comes to, dares to come to the university and present anything obvious. So that's why I'm, I rephrased my, my presentation title something like this. And the, the, there are a couple of words that needs probably a little bit of explanation. One is the, the, the term global educational reform movement. This is something that I have, uh, I've been working on that concept for, for many years, and it's, a, it's a one of the central themes in my book. And by global education reform movement, I simply mean a kind of a unofficial orthodoxy that many countries are following when they are in the business of improving quality and services in their education systems, um, mostly referring to uh, compulsory education. So I'm not looking at higher education or adult education or anything like this. I'm focusing on educating children all the way up to the PISA uh, thing, which is normally the uh, end of the compulsory education. So this, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about w w what I've seen in my work in uh, different countries that made me call it a global educational reform movement. If you take the first letter of each of these four words, you get an interesting term, germ. Right? And you may guess that it may have a good things there, but it mostly have a problematic issues that the that the germ is uh, creating. Just like a germ, germs are primarily um, predominantly bad things for people. You know, sometimes if you get infection, you don't feel well, and if you get a bad infection, you may be in a very serious state of health. And remaining immune refers to the Finnish education system's ability to resist some of these things that, that you will hear, and this is basically my story. But let me start by making three... Um, uh, kind of a n notions that I think are important. First, of, I'm, I'm not standing here this, this evening to tell you that Finland has the best education system in the world, because we simply don't. And we don't know that. We, 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 can, we can speak about part of the education system that is measured by the international assessments, like the OECD PISA study, for example, but there are many other things in education that are very important, and we don't know very much about those things. So that's why I hate to be somebody who is seen as an apostle of promoting the best education system in the world. I'm, I'm rather trying to tell you a story of a public school system that has been able to become something that about 85% of Finnish taxpayers feel confident with. And I think it's very close to the world record in any country to have an 85% confidence level in the eyes of the taxpayers in any country. I think there are not many countries who have more, uh, kind of a higher rate in the in, in, in eyes of the, the taxpayers. So that's, I think that is an achievement, if you can do that. So I'm not promoting Finnish education system, but I'm, I'm trying to tell you stories about what we have been doing and why so many people seem to be thinking inside Finland. And in Finland, honestly speaking, people don't care about what people think about us outside of the country. So that's, that's why I think this is an interesting story. Secondly, I'm not trying to convince you that if you just follow what Finland has been doing and do exactly what we have been doing over the, during the course of the last 40 years, everything will be fine in this state or in this beautiful country, Australia. No, it doesn't work like this. 
And I, 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 I think that there are some things that we can learn from, but we should not go and imitate any system and say that now we have a good system, except France, that is doing this regularly <laughs> with Finland. I, I was invited to um, the, the Prime Minister's uh, office a couple of years ago in Paris, and the first thing I heard there was that they said that we have fixed our primary school system by taking three things from Finland, and now it's okay. <laughs> and the, of, of course, the first thing I have to say is that you cannot do it like this. It doesn't, it, it's not simple like this to fix the systems. And thirdly, I think what is important here also is, is to understand that Many of these good ideas and innovations, if, if I can call them innovations, in our classrooms and schools in Finland are from other countries. Just like if I was somebody from Singapore or Japan or Korea, I would say exactly the same, that we have been very actively learning from others, including Australia, uh, and not only about research, but also the innovations in the pedagogy and leadership and school improvement and many other things. So that has been a kind of a skill of Finland to travel around the world and listen to um, uh, where the good ideas are. You know, my grandmother taught me one very important lesson, and she said to me that you have two of these and one of that, and use them in the same proportion. And this is where Finns are very good, that we are rather listening than talking, and if you listen more than you talk, you are likely to get good ideas, and that's exactly what we have been doing, all right? So with these three notions, I would like to kick off and speak to you a little bit about the the country first. Some things I think are important to to know, to make sure that we have a we have a uh, common understanding. And then I'll speak a little bit about the the germ, how I, I see this thing. I'll show you a little video clip as well, not from Finland, but from germ, like a, at the heart of the infection, how it looks like. And then I have some lessons for you, some uh, through some key policies, key ideas what we have been doing, and what I think could be something that um, people here and, and elsewhere could listen to from Finland. So are you ready for this? Good. So if you, if you look at your watch, I don't care. <laughs> but if you check whether it's still running, <laughs> that makes me worried. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. So um, how many of you have been in Finland? OK, quite, quite a few. Probably 10 years ago. If I was here 10 years ago, there were very few people who have done this. This is actually my, at least my observation in different parts of the country, that not too many people know about Finland. So if I ask this question now from all of you, but particularly those who haven't been in the country, simply what, what, comes, to mind, what comes to your mind when you think about Finland? What, what is the kind of a first image? If you close your eyes and just let the, the picture come. Cold and ice, yeah, and dark. Yeah. Santa Claus, what else? Excellent rally drivers. Rally drivers, crazy people, yeah? Music. All right. You know, this, I'm asking this because whenever we are dealing and having a conversation about this thing with people who have not a first-hand experience in Finland, this is one of the first images that people have, that Finland looks like this. And not only somewhere, but everywhere. But this is, this is how Finland is. And it's not only sometimes, but all the time. You know, there are people who seriously believe that this is how Finland looks 12 months a year, 24 hours a day, always like this, yeah? And then some of these people come to me and say that, hey, now I understand why Finland Finnish kids are so good in Pisa, because it's always like this, yeah? <laughs> There's nothing else to do. They, they go to school, yeah? <laughs> they cannot go out. They're, they're, there's no recess. They go, come back home and do homework all year round, because it's always like this. You cannot play football or cricket or whatever you want to do because of the conditions. No, this is a serious, uh, serious thing, yeah? There are so many other, other images that we could go through, but I don't, I don't want to go to this. Santa Claus is one of those. But, you know, most of these ideas that people have about Finland have nothing to do with education, unless you have heard about this story. But if you don't know this, nobody associates Finland into university, education, science, or anything. It's, it, all these images are something funny, drunken people or crazy trolley drivers or something that has nothing to do with education. And that's why many people find it very difficult to understand that how in the country where Santa Claus lives and where it's uh, always like this and people are drinking beer in the minus 10 degrees outside, like somebody said to me the other day, you can have a school system that is, everybody's admiring. It's just, you just don't understand this. Okay, I have three things that I think are uh, kind of a conditional, uh, a fundamental issues to be mentioned here if we, are, if we are about to understand 
um, why the system is enjoying the kind of a global uh, reputation that it has now. The first one is, uh, and this is very important, that we Finland has not always been a high-performing education system. We are now celebrating the 40th year of introduction of our current basic school, the nine-year comprehensive school system. Exactly 40 years ago, uh, the implementation of this system started. So it, it has really taken 30 years until the first PISA before the, um, the results were visible. And before that, you know, this is where we, uh, where we started to do this reform. We had a school system that was, according to the international studies, perform, performing below the, uh, the world average, and that also had a huge equity gap because we had many of our schools, most of our grammar schools were private schools, and they were educating some part of the society, and then there was a school system for those who didn't get into the grammar schools or private schools or, or somebody else. Um, and only very few people had, a, uh, had attained a kind of a higher degree in education. So we were not really a developed education system uh, before the beginning of this, uh, this reform. And something like this has happened. And if you want to get an evidence of this, I have written this book that is actually the reason why I'm here also in Australia and New Zealand this, uh, this autumn, Finnish Lessons, where I try to collect all the data and information to prove that this has really happened. Yeah? Because it's not obvious that, that Finland has experienced this progress faster than the world on average. Remember, there are those who say that because it's always ice and cold and dark, maybe Finland has always been good. And people say that we are small, homogeneous, strange place. So maybe Finland has always had a high performance in education because of these things. And there's nothing to ask about. Yeah? But my book shows, and the international data also proves, that this type of steady progress has actually uh, happened. W what do you think is the, the line of Australia here? Yeah, I don't know exactly, but this is what I saw the other day, last week here, when one of the authorities from your, your federal government was uh, talking about this. And his argument was that Australia has had a very high performance and high performing system, but gradually, not necessarily steadily like this, but the, the, the direction has been downwards. Okay, okay, and why this is important? This is important because if this is true related to Finland, then we can ask the question that what Finns did, what, what has happened in the country in order to uh, achieve this type of uh, steady progress. Okay? So the first thing is that we, ha we have not always been a high-performing education system. The second one, and equally important, is that Finland has never aimed to be number one or never aimed to be among number five countries, like your government has now set the goal that Australia will be by 2025 among top five countries in educational performance. Finland has never formulated its education policies in, in such a way that we would, be, we would be compared to others, okay? Except in one case, yeah? You know, Sweden is our uh, dear next door neighbor, just New Zealand is to yours. And we use a lot of uh, same types of stories about Swedes that you do with the New Zealanders. So, um, so I was, um, when I was working in the Ministry of Education in the National Board of, uh, in the mid-1990s, this was about five years before the first OECD PISA study came, and it already created a kind of a um, political conversations among the ministers of education when they were setting, starting to set their goals for the first PISA study when the results were published in December 2001. So I, was, I went to Sweden with our minister, and, and this is what the Swedish minister then was uh, trying to communicate to us in his very long presentation in Stockholm, saying that Sweden will have, be number one nation and has the best edu the school system in the world by the first, when the first PISA results are published. So we are sitting there and making notes about the Swedish uh, strategy, just like we have made notes about the Swedish uh, school system reform ever since. So we thought that you know, this is the way we have to do these things. And then our minister's term came to re respond to this, and she said that, thank you very much, Mr. Minister. This is all very interesting, and um, we wish you good luck with this. But I can tell you that 
our goals in Finland are much more modest than yours here in Sweden, because you see, in Finland, for us, it's enough to be ahead of Sweden. <laughs> And, and, you know, this, instead of, you know, phrasing our education policies like many countries are doing now, and, you know, the interesting thing is that now if you travel around the world and you sit with the ministers and governments and ask to see their education strategies and plans, many countries have the similar intention than your federal government has, to be among five best countries in the world. And everybody who knows the PISA data knows that there's only one place available there. Yeah? All four, four seats are already taken, so there, there must, be a, uh, must be a rough, there, uh, rough competition there. But we have, we have always emphasized the, the fact that we want to have a good school for everybody, that we want to have an equitable system of education that is serving particularly those who find it more difficult to be successful in education. And some, this is something that is very difficult to explain when people ask that how in Finland you have able to maintain the same policy since 19, early 1970s until today. We still have, if you look at the current governments, uh, we have a six-party coalition government. If you look at their education strategy, it's titled Enhancing Equity. Okay? And it remains the same for the, for the last 40 years. From government to government, we, has, we have had 20 different governments and about 35 different ministers of education. And they have all respected the same goal, same idea. They may have changed it a little bit here and there, but they have not changed the overall idea. And of course, if you, look at, if you think about the work of the schools and principals and teachers, it has everything to do with the, uh, with the kind of a line of improvement that they have had. Because the, if you're a school principal in Finland, you can, know, you can be sure that the next new government will not change the main direction. They may bring some new things, but they are not going to introduce something completely new that they have to start to do. Okay? So this is a very important notion that we have never wanted to be number one, um, but we have rather uh, ha have the, the equity as a main driver. And then the third one, which says that we are doing fairly well in many other things. So, Countries are compared in many other areas as well, but ex education. The education is a fairly recent one, but now we have, they have, there are a number of things, almost anything that you can, you can imagine. Here are some examples of the, um, the Finnish performance, and you can easily find these if you go on Google, if you want to see where your country is, or New Zealand, or whether, whether you're better than New Zealanders or Kiwis, you can do that as well. But these are some of the examples, and I think many of them are very important for most of the countries like national economic competitiveness or equity or uh, child health and well-being, uh, poverty rate. Innovation is a very important thing for most of the OECD countries now. And if you, if you just ben benchmark Finland to the, um, uh, to the United States, you will see that we are, perform we are very competitive in many of these many other areas with the United States and most other countries actually in the world. Yeah. So it's no wonder that if we add education here as one more item, that education is also doing well. So that's why we have many people in Finland who claim, like myself, that it's a system that makes education work well. It's not, it's not the structure or the elements of the system. Like in many other places, people seem to think that we need to have good teachers and uh, standards, high standards and good assessment system and high accountability before things work. But in Finland, we know that it's a system that is helping the, the um, schools and the whole, whole education perform better. Look at the technological advancement. This is where Finland has been performing very high for the last 15 years. And how many of you know Angry Birds? You know Angry Birds? If you play Angry Birds, raise your hand. Okay, your granddaughter plays, yeah. But you should play it, Barry, sometimes because... <laughs> They will come up with the, the um, amazing educational platform in February. Just wait and see what Angry Birds will do. Yeah? But you know that Angry Birds is from Finland? No? Now you know, OK? So you know that Finland has Angry Birds and happy people. <laughs> yeah? There are many countries where they say that we have angry people but happy birds. Yeah? But Finland has the other way around. So now, now we know this one. OK, so these three things, are, I think they hopefully help you to understand that there's nothing, we are not talking about the miracle here. A miracle of education, I think, doesn't exist. 
That is a kind of a systematic way of thinking about what is important and making things happen. And this, this has been the skill of Finland for many, many, uh, many years and in many issues, that we are able to make things, little things work. And that's why um, I think education is uh, just part of this thing. So the critical question for tonight is, that is the, the progress that you saw there since the 1970s, is it because we have had similar, similar policies and, and uh, same type of reforms that everybody else, like Australia or United States or Germany, England, Sweden, Norway, or is it because we have had different policies and a different way of implementing related reforms? Okay? And why I'm asking this? I'm asking this because I meet people every now and then who claim that maybe Finland, because it's always dark and ice and cold and we are only five and a half million, rather homogeneous, that we, maybe we have been implementing the same educational reform ideas, but because of these conditions we have just been lucky with this implementation. That is all wrong. There are people who, when you know more about this thing, who say that it's not, not only that we have different policies, but we have almost the opposite way of thinking about education reforms than many other countries. And now I, I would like to help you to see a little bit what I mean by this very different, uh, different way of thinking about education. And this is something uh, that hopefully explains a little bit what Finland is doing. Are you, are you doing all right? It's 6.30 in the evening and I'm the only one who is standing between you and the drinks over there. <laughs> But try to, try to take a few more minutes, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to get something, something interesting out of this. So the, let me tell you a little bit about this, this global education reform movement. And this is a, since this is a university, I, uh, I accept and understand if people disagree with me and see things in a different way. This is my own way of uh, thinking. This is not a theory. You know, when I, when I was a young student and I decided to become a teacher in a university, I had two theories how to educate children, and, but no kids. Now I have two sons, but no theories anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to many people, uh, I know, all right? So, um, oh, it's cutting, cutting the first uh, letter away, but you, you still understand. The first element, you know, there, there are many elements in, the, in this global educational reform movement program that you, you, may, you may look at this in a different ways. Some of them are good things, like a strong focus on learning and raising expectations for everybody, which are typical things in many countries, linking as classroom assessment for learning in school more than before, and, and uh, so on. But I'm going to look at the four things that I think have been, appear to be problematic in many places, and show you how Finland is responding to these uh, four things. First one of them is a competition idea, and, and th you know this much better than I do. What, what does it mean when we, when we see education system or schools as a um, as a, entities that are competing against one another and what does it mean when we open education to a marketplace idea. So this is basically what I see in, in different parts of the world that the schools and teachers and principals are increasingly finding themselves in a situation where they are competing over resources, over students, over good, um, uh, good stuff and parents among other things against one another. And the, the simple idea, of course, is that when we enhance competition, it will raise the quality of services. Just like it does if you have a mobile phone network provider, if there's a one provider, quality is normally low and price is high. But if we have two or three or more providers, uh, then the price is going to go down and services, quality of services is going to in, uh, improve. So this is kind of a common way of thinking about education as well, that when we put somehow teachers and schools in the position that they, have, they feel that they are competing against other schools or other teachers, that they will improve what they do. It's a co very common sense of uh, thinking. This is um, from the um, yesterday's newspaper here that I was reading, saying Victorian schools fail on disability score that tells how some of the schools, I don't know whether this is true or not, but how some of the schools have been making sure that they will be doing better in this competition against the other schools by asking children who are not likely to do well in the tests be away from the school when, when their performance is measured, among other things, which is a, just one symptom, one side of the, uh, 
uh, what, what the competition can, uh, can bring here. The se second one is the standardization. Uh, and th this is, again, something that you can easily see in different parts of the world if you travel around where... Uh, what I mean by standardization is that the central government, typically, or central educational agency, is standardizing the educational goals and then asking schools and teachers and principals to work towards these standardized, uh, standardized outcomes. So if I simplify this a little bit, standardization refers to the idea that we are edu trying to educate everybody towards the same standards. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with this idea. But I, how I see this, this world today is that we should be, instead of educating everybody towards the same standards, we should try to educate everybody to be different, to different standards. And this is, of course, a dif difficult thing to do in the setting of school. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this when it comes to Finland. But this is a kind of a typical situation how standardized uh, education may look like in a classroom. You see that this is, the, this is a very common classroom in Finland. You know, we have a comprehensive school system where we take everybody. All the children are welcome and they are randomly assigned to a classroom. So there are all sorts of uh, individuals there. And if the teacher is saying that everybody must do the same thing, in this case, climb the tree, this teacher knows you know, at the same time when he's asking these, people, uh, uh, these students to do this thing, that most of them, many of them will fail because they, they cannot, goldfish is not very good climbing in, uh, in the tree. But, you know, this is, a, this is a funny picture, but this happens in our schools every single day, that we are asking people to do things that we know, the teacher knows that some of these kids can never perform these things. And only because it's standardized, it's something that, we are asked to check if everybody can do this thing. And, and this is what makes education, teaching, and learning so complicated. That in a way, we have to learn certain things. We have to standardize something. But if we standardize too much, we are in finding ourselves in this type of uh, uh, situation. Then the school choice is the third one. And these are, of course, all related issues. The school choice is a kind of a related thing to competition. You cannot have competition if, if there's no parental choice for schools. Okay. So that, that's why we are seeing more and more, even in the countries that used to be very uh, strongly controlling school choice, like Sweden, for example, where there were no alternative schools before uh, 20 years ago. Or look at the Eastern Europe or Soviet Union, Russia nowadays, uh, what, what is happening there, or China. That the school choice is a kind of a global phenomena where different types of schools are coming uh, to play the role. In, in the United States, for example, the charter school movement is a very common. In, in the UK, you have uh, uh, secondary academies and free schools now and all sorts of types of things that are, are implemented in the name of providing parents a choice to have good education for their children and, as some people say, also improve the equity, which is not... Uh, not the case here. So, so these are some of the, um, I was in the States a couple of weeks ago talking about these things and the media is full of these stories about what, are the, what have been the consequences of uh, this uncontrolled uh, school choice. I have nothing against uh, uh, school choice and having different alternatives, but we have, we have to decide whether we want to have choice for parents or equity for the system, and this is my argument here tonight. Okay, so the school choice is the third one, the introduction of different alternative uh, models to educate your children. And then finally, the test-based accountability, which is a common thing. Uh, again, you know this very well here, where the teachers and schools are held increasingly accountable for students' uh, learning, and in many cases, uh, the way to do, organize this accountability is to use the standardized testing uh, to do this. And it's, it's not only Australia and New Zealand, this is everywhere, almost everywhere, happening as we speak like this. And of course, this is, uh, this is related to many things. And I want to show you one um, deep symptom of germ. And if you ask me, the test-based accountability has had so far probably the most serious consequences to education systems of all of these uh, four that, that I mentioned. Here, and this is from the um, this is from the film called "Should Be Detachment." Have you seen this? 
if you haven't seen it. It's a, new, it's a fairly new film, and you recognize this uh, actor. He's uh, Adrian Prody, the, the man, the actor who played in a pianist, I think, the pianist, okay? And this, this film is about a substitute teacher in New York City who was working in the school about one month at a time. So he was substituting teachers who, that were away. And this film is about one month of his life in, um, in American school. And just take a look at this. It's, a, it's an event like, evening like this in this film. So it's going to be a minute and a half. Evening like this where the principal comes to talk to the staff. There should be teachers almost like you, but see, just see how many teachers there are. And listen to the conversation, what they, uh, what they speak here. All right. So now, now the fair question is, uh, before we go to look at the Finnish, what, what, how Finland has been responding to these, uh, uh, these um, uh, obvious infections, is it, has the uh, global education reform movement been successful? And you know, all these things, they started already in the 1980s. And 1990s was a kind of a high season for um, uh, introducing the competition, standardization, testing, account accountability-driven education policies in different parts of the world. Um, so we have a lot of evidence through actually through, uh, through the OECD PISA data that is telling us a lot on the success of education policies in 1990s. And this is where we have to be careful with when we are using the, the um, uh, international data is that we, we, cannot, we cannot look at the 2009 PISA results and start to blame the education policies that we have in place today. We have to understand where these policies are coming from and, and what could be the impact. So here is one picture, one way to do this. And I have selected here the um, mathematics uh, national average scores in different countries, selected countries here in 2000, 2003, and 2006 uh, OECD PISA study, okay? So these are not all the OECD countries. OECD has more than 30 uh, countries in, um, uh, as a member countries. But all of these countries are examples of the education systems where these germ-related education policies have somehow been in place in 1990s. That they, the, some of the key uh, driving ideas or main ideas, policy ideas, have been, have been there. And so what do you see here? They're all declining, yeah? yeah and I, I could change this to science or literacy, and it doesn't change the overall picture uh, too much. This is Finland. And you will see that Finland started in 2000 fairly high and has been uh, progressing in... Um, uh, in the 2003-2006 studies without competition or choice or other things, yeah? Which is, uh, of course, doesn't prove scientifically anything, but it's kind of an interesting uh, question. Often I ask this from ministers and politicians to just to explain me, explain me what has happened here, okay? So the Finnish way, instead of comp competition, um, and insisting that the schools and teachers are competing against one another. We have driven our education policies systematically and deliberately so that cooperation, collaboration, networking, and sharing is the kind of a key idea. And this is not only my idea. If you want to have another opinion on this, just take a look at the OECD expert team's review report from Finland in 2007-2008. Uh, where they very clearly um, uh, conclude that the, the culture of education in Finland is one of sharing and networking and doing things together rather than competing through their interviews with the school principals and authorities and politicians and others. So I think this is a very, dif very important distinction between Finland and many other countries that we see education as something that we do together and we share and try to help one another rather than try to compete uh, against uh, our neighbors. Rather than standardization, I think Finland has been systematically, at least during the last 20 years, focused on personalization or in individualization of its education. In other words, think about education as something where we educate people to be different, to be themselves, whoever they are. And I often say that Finnish education system is probably one of the most individualized in the world because our law on education says that education has to be organized according to the needs of, of each and every individual. 
So it means that we have to see, we have to have an individual approach to education rather than standardized approach. And that's why we have every school in Finland is responsible for their own curriculum. So all the 3,500 curricula in Finland are different because they are designed by a different group of teachers and principals. And that's what the customization or personalization uh, means. Rather than school choice, what we have done in Finland during the last 40 years is that we have, we have school choice, so parents can choose the school. We have some private schools, but they're not really private because you cannot, uh, you cannot charge money for tuition. But we have managed the school choice so that it's not dis disturbing the equity. Because if I repeat again what I said earlier, that I think that at the level of the system you can either have free market school choice type of system like many countries have, but you, can, you, you have to sacrifice with equity. Or you can have build an equitable education system where you have to manage the choice. Okay? So you can have these two things at the same time. There's no education system um, within the OECD that would have open market for parental choice and high equity. Somehow these, this is a kind of a political choice that we have to be making. So that's why I'm saying that we are, Finland and other Scandinavian countries have been probably better managing the school choice by postponing it to the upper secondary level and trying to keep the choice limited. Or like in Finland, that we have a lot of school choice within the school, but not between the schools. All the schools are basically very similar in Finland. But if you go inside the school and see what the schools are doing, there's a lot of choice there for parents, for students. So this is another way to uh, do this thing. And finally, rather than having a test-based accountability, we have uh, tried to build a trust-based professionalism. And there are two important words here. One is trust, and the other one is professionalism. And I will come back to this, what this professionalism means a little bit later. But Finland is the country where we still have, and hopefully continue to have, the very high degree of trust between the people in the society. And that, of course, helps us to have a system that will perform in a different way. All right, are you still all right? Okay, I'll tell you next, and, and rather briefly, about the three key driving ideas that I think have been, uh, as a consequence of these, uh, these the Finnish way um, uh, ideas, and hope that this will help you also to understand why we have done these things in a, uh, in a way we have done. This is a picture I, I constructed from taking the OECD PISA results again, or data from the um, OECD database, and then lo look how the students' performance in different countries is related to income inequality. In other words, the income gap in the different countries. And if this is the average, so this is the OECD average performance there in the, um, uh, in the vertical line, and this is the average income inequality, income gap in uh, wealthy countries in the horizontal line. Where do you think Australia is? <coughs> Where would you put your country? The right, somewhere here. Yeah, it's, it's here, exactly. So you have a fairly large inequality in income, but you also have a good, uh, good performance in, in PISA. Where would be Finland? Yeah, so Finland is over there. So we are, Finland and Australia are actually in a way outliers in this picture because everybody, almost everybody else is then before behaving as they should, okay? So here are some of the countries, um, not all, but some of the countries are here, and this is the correlation, what you see. So just like Wilkinson and Pickett are saying that if you have more equal society, you are likely to have better learning outcomes as well. Of course, this is not true everywhere, but there's a kind of a correlation between um, in income inequality and educational performance. Let's take another one. I really love the OECD, um, uh, OECD PISA work because there's so, much, there's, there's so much different ways to look at things. And rather than show you how Finland is performing vis-a-vis -vis other countries, I'll, I have reconstructed the PISA data in a, in a little bit different way. And with this picture, I try to help you to see that there are two dimensions in educational development. Remember. Swedish minister was endorsing that they want to have an excellent, high-quality education system by year 2000. And that's why these are the things that this plan and strategy probably includes, that there's nothing strange here. When we talk about improving quality, we talk about uh, competition choice, 
data assessments, teacher quality, teacher education, accountability, and all these things, okay? As Phil was saying, I was working, I worked five years in Washington, D.C. in the United States, um, but I'm fine now. <laughs> and and many, many of the education re reforms and programs that we were sent to do in different countries were basically this matrix. The very, very little other things than, than these that we were asked to do in different countries from one country to another. It didn't change too much, okay? But now we know that there's another one, and this is thanks to the OECD work um, that has helped uh, me and many other researchers to see that there's another dimension that is very important, and it's the equity in education. And I add here, the, uh, while you think about what, what, do, what do I mean by equity, this is the um, definition that the Gonski Review uses. I think Gonski Review has an excellent section on when they're discussing, defining and discussing the equity, and this is directly from the Gonski Review. It's a strength, or in this case weakness, of the relationship between performance and socioeconomic background when we are measuring this. In other words, how much children's family background is affecting teaching. And everybody who is in this business of education knows that this is the effect, yeah? If we don't do anything, we can predict how children are doing in a school by looking what their parents are doing, what is their education, what is their home like, okay? So this weakness means that if the country is this way, it means that the relationship between the family background and learning in school is weak, that there's a, the correlation is weaker. If the country is here, it means that there's a strong correlation. In other words, the, the education is kind of a enforcing, strengthening uh, this law that we know very well. Okay, and this is the, where the OECD average is again. Are there, not everybody knows that the OECD is also measuring the equity, just like it's measuring the excellence or quality of education, yeah? This is a kind of a new thing for many people. Now, where is Australia again? How equitable is your system of education? This way or that way? So it's actually not that bad. You are, doing, you, you are doing much better in terms of equity than New Zealand, <laughs> which is very good if you, if you don't like rugby. This is a very good thing here, yeah? Depends whether you use the correlation or the same. Yeah, yeah. This, this data is directly from the, um, the 2009 PISA report, so I just took the numbers and put them here, how, how it looks like in, when we are using the reading literacy as a, um, as a marker. So these are some of the other countries. You see the New Zealand is over there, and these countries are falling here. So, so there are not too many outliers. For example, there are no countries where you have very high equity but low quality, or very high quality but low equity, they are not there. Singapore is one of those countries where they have lower than average equity score, but very high um, uh, achievement. But where's, fin where's Finland? Do you see Finland? No? This is where Finland was 40 years ago, yeah? This is where we started roughly 40 years ago. We had a very inequitable system where the performance, the students' learning uh, results were below the, the world average, okay? So take a look at the Finnish map now, what happens there. So this has been the road of Finland during the last 30 years or 40 years. And we have went all the way to the family of four countries that the OECD is calling high-performing <coughs> education systems, meaning that the high performance in terms of equity and uh, quality of, of education, all right? So you see that there's one more free place there for Australia if you want to do that, if your prime minister is eager to do this. But my message to the um, uh, policymakers and reformers here is that if you, if you follow what the other countries have been doing, all of these uh, countries with Finland there, they have reached this position by investing in equity systematically working on the uh, things in the education reforms that is enhancing systematically uh, the equity of education system. And some of these things that these, all these countries have done, and particularly Finland has done all of these five things that I'm going to show you. One is to work out the funding thing. And you have now, after the Konski review, you, have, you are considering a new way of funding your education system. But it's very important that the funding is taking care of the particularly those children who find it more difficult to learn, and those schools who have more of these children who need special um, arrangements in order to learn. So funding is one thing. The early childhood development is extremely important. I could talk about the, the early childhood development in Finland the whole evening to you. But I can only say that 
without a kind of a systematic way of providing well-being and health and care for children, Finland would not be where it is now. That this is how important the, the early childhood and development uh, system is. Luckily, the early childhood development has become now an issue that is in, uh, in the agenda of many countries, including the World Bank, for example, is now uh, more actively considering early childhood development as part of the, the strategy. Well-being in school. And this is something that Finland, for example, has done during the last 40 years, is to try to make sure that the well-being exists for those children who don't feel well and have the same similar conditions at home than all the others. So that's why we are offering free meal and uh, health check and dental check and counseling and support every day in every school throughout the country. And that's why well-being is something that many Finnish teachers see as a primary thing in the school and academic education and teaching and learning is kind of a secondary thing, at least in the elementary, the first uh, three or four years of education. Personalization, as you heard, we have to have a kind of an individualized approach, otherwise we will lose those who are in, in a special needs um, situation. Finland has about one third of the uh, comprehensive school students are labeled as special needs kids. So it's a huge number of uh, children because of this uh, strategy. And then managing choice. I think this is very important for all of those who want to uh, improve the performance of the education system, that somehow you have to take a position to how much you allow choice in your system. Okay? And one way to see this is to postpone or delay the school choice as late as you can do. And if you look at the, o the OECD, uh, OECD data, all of those countries that are allowing school choice early on, like Germany, for example, or others, have serious issues with their equity and uh, variation between schools. Okay, so this could be one one lesson for the uh, Australian uh, educators and policymakers also to think about what the what the equity really means and how we could convert this equity is important into concrete um, uh, concrete ideas. The second policy is the less is more idea and I'll, I'll try to hurry up a little bit. Many people claim that Finland is probably performing well because we are doing a lot of things uh, and spending a lot of time in a school and uh, long school days and so on, but this doesn't really um, um, have any, any fact, factual ground. This is from the uh, Education at a Glance that is uh, uh, OECD is uh, one of the flagship publications annually, and it shows how Australia, for example, has much more intended instruction time for children between 7 and 14 than in Finland. This difference there is about two years, two years of formal schooling. And here your children go to school when they are five. Yeah, in Finland it's seven. Yeah. So we get about three or four years difference at the, at the time when uh, pupils are sitting the, um, um, sitting the OECD PISA, PISA test. So interesting finding is that the countries are very different in this respect. How, how long and how much they are insisting students to spend in school. So why this is important for the, for the Finns? We, we believe that the play is the job of children. Yeah? And if you want to be good in play, in other words, if you want to understand how your mind works and what is the power of your imagination, power of your mind, so that you can use it for new things, creating new things, new ideas. Together with other people, you need to practice that play for, as Gladwell is saying, 10,000 hours. It's about 10 years of play. And, and that's why the Finnish school system and daycare system is putting a very strong accent to learn how to play and understand, be good in play in, in our country. We don't have too much homework in the elementary levels. In many primary schools, the homework is done in the school so that the children can play. Yeah, it's very important uh, in Finland. There are many parents like myself who think that it's, it's a good idea to keep children away from institutions like schools as, lo as late as possible <laughs> and let them play, try to give them an alternative way of developing themselves. Okay, so this is, I showed this today in the, was speaking here in the faculty and um, my theory is that if, if we take the, the traditional productivity law uh, in the economics, for example, that the, effort, the productivity, what you get out of the work is uh, your effort times human capital or your intelligence, how, how smart you are with what you do. Uh, this is not really working in Finland. 
Yeah? This is a common sense formula, isn't it? If you don't do anything, if your effort is zero, you don't, you, you're going to get zero out, right? And by changing these, if you are very smart, you can do less. Yeah? But in Finland, it's rather something like this. That we have this uh, C factor here, the C value, that is um, uh, culture. Meaning that we have, you know, this is where Finland probably is a little bit different, that we have the trust, collaboration, and values that are favorable to education that are helping us to, together with the human capital or knowledge of things, have a little bit less of this E. Yeah? So that's why we are maybe able to do, perform the same way, produce the similar things with the less effort because we have this culture factor here. And this is, I leave this up to you to um, argue with me if you think that I'm not, uh, I'm not serious about this thing. But Finnish society is a culture of, uh, is a society where the collaboration and doing things together, trusting people, relying on one another is a very strong thing still. And we can do many things because of these facts, unlike in many other places where you cannot do this. This is about the money, again, from the uh, education at a glance. The interesting finding here is that Finland is not really spending too much money on education. This is for the uh, primary, sec lower secondary, and, and upper secondary, like a pre-university education. And you will see here that we have no private funding there. We have about 2% of our total education spending is from private sources, whereas Australia has one of the largest private proportions in funding pre-university education. There's only Chile, I think, and somebody else has, a Korea, I think, has a higher, higher ones. So we are, funding, we are funding our systems in a different way. There are sometimes people who say that maybe Finland is good because we are spending a huge amount of money, which is not true. I think Australia, this high white bar here is because of your, this revolution investment thing, right? That you are putting a lot of money on building schools. And this is 2009 data, just so you will see it there. If you take that capital investment away, then it looks a little bit different, OK? So this is my third one, my third thing, and then I'm, I'm winding up a little bit. This is my niece, Vera, OK? Isn't she nice? It's my, sis, my sister's daughter, yeah? And she's, a tw she's about 25, 26 years in this picture. And this picture was taken um, when she was just graduating from the Department of Teacher Education in the University of Helsinki. So she's a primary school teacher now who has specialized in special education in teaching in a primary school. About seven years ago, she called me in the spring and said, that, Uncle, I have decided to become a primary school teacher. What should I do? And I said, Vera. You are a very bright girl. You have the uh, highest marks in all the subjects in your, uh, in your high school diploma, and your examination results are perfect. You play music, you sing, you dance, you do sports, all these things. Just go there, and, and they will take you. About three months later, she called me in tears, saying that they didn't take me. So of course, I wanted to know what happened there, and said, so tell me what. Uh, what happened? And she said that the, the first exam that everybody has to sit was very easy. They give these kids a book to read, and this book in that spring it contained seven scientific articles that were published in peer-reviewed journals, and they had to read these seven articles and then answer the multiple choice questions. Uh, and you had to get quite a lot of those correct. <laughs> Okay? And she said that it's, e it's easy because she was a good student. Second thing, she was invited to um, to a demonstration where she has to show what she can do with the, uh, how she can plan activities with other people and how she can, together with other people, implement those plans in front of the panel of professors and lecturers in my university. Okay? And she said that this was easy because I had been doing these things and I had a nice group and so on. So the third thing was a panel interview. Okay? And the panel, the professors give, gave her something to read so that she had 15 minutes to read a paper. And then they were asking questions from this paper again. Okay? And then they asked about this activity. And then they focused on her as a person. Okay? The, I asked Vera that, so what did you find was the most difficult question that they asked you? And she said that, I think the question when they asked me that, why did you come here? And she said that, excuse me? And then one of the panelists said that, you know, Vera, with your diploma, with your marks and grades, 
You could be a medical doctor, a lawyer, or businessman, anything you want in a minute. But why did you come here to our school? And then, of course, I said, so what, what, what did you say? And she said that, you know, I was surprised with this question. So I said that, you know, my uncle is a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother, and as you heard, my grand grandfather and all the grandfathers in the line of the last 200 years, they have all been teachers. So teaching is a kind of a family business, you see. And the panel said, aha. Uh -huh. And do you have anything else to add? And then she said that something that caused her this place. And she said, I love children. That was the wrong answer, of course. Because the panel assumes that everybody who is there must love children. You don't apply to the School of Education if you don't love children, yeah? So the panel, what they heard her saying is that she was not able to explain what is her moral, deep commitment to teach, yeah? How does she know that she has this commitment, okay? So she asked me that, so, uncle, what should I do? And I said, if you really want to become a teacher and you don't want to change your mind, go and apply to be a teaching assistant in one of the schools here and work there a year, apply again, and then explain you why you think this is your job, which she did, and she was accepted, and now she graduated from the academically very uh, demanding master's degree that is a basic requirement to teach in Finland. We don't let anybody else to teach in our country except the ones who have master's degree in, from one of our universities. And if you think that I was just cherry-picking Vera and she was a kind of a um, rare case, this is what happened in my university last spring. I teach uh, in the University of Helsinki as well every now and then. We had about 2,000 applicants last spring to primary school teacher education program that is a master's degree based. And we accepted 120. Okay? So there are many people like Vera among these 1,900 who were not successful. Many of them will come again next year. They will come again two years from now. Some of them will come again three years from now. Last spring, last summer, we accepted somebody who was trying seven times before she was accepted. Yeah? So this is how we hold a very strict quality control at entry. So we know that none of, the, none of these 120 students in my university is there to say that, I don't know exactly what I want to do. I just came here because I want to you know, have a break. All of them are there because they, they want to be there. They know why they want to be <coughs> teachers. And many of them are like Vera, that they already have experience behind. The average age of this 120 group is about 22 or 23 years. So many of them, they have experience behind. So this is a kind of a secret of Finland, why we have the system. And it has been like this for the last 20, at least 20 years. Every year, the same thing in all the universities. We have 7,000 applicants to eight universities master's programs, and we take about 660 students. So more than 10%, uh, less than 10% uh, pass rate, okay? So I, I think wh why this is important is that we, we are having young people going into, the, in our, into our schools year after year who will stay there. You know, you know, they will work there a long time, okay? Not necessarily in the same school, but they, they go to, into teaching profession because they want to be teachers. And again, Gladwell is saying this 10,000 hour rule, if you apply it into teaching, you can ask how many, how many years do you need to teach to be a good teacher? And I'm asking this from all of you who have been in the business of teaching. There are very few people who say that after first year I was a great teacher. There are very few people who say that after three years, I felt that I'm ex excellent, I'm the perfect teacher, no? I left teaching profession after eight years, not because I wanted to, but because there were new opportunities. And I remember my last year in school, I often think about this, when I had this feeling that maybe, maybe, I understand now what it is to be a teacher. Because I had this executive control of things. I was not nervous when I went to the staff room and had a conversation with my colleagues. But it took eight years, seven to eight years. Many people say that it's about 10 years of practice in teaching. And this is what most people, most teachers in Finland spend far beyond these 10 years, okay? And there are education systems now on the planet where teachers are only teaching a few years and then they leave. There are some systems where half of the teachers leave by the end of the fifth, their fifth year. 
and they will, these countries will never have a system of education where they have good teachers over there. Yeah? So this is my conclusion now for you. And this will take about one minute. I'm not going to speak too much about these things. So the question is that how Finland has remained immune to this global educational reform movement. You saw the three policy, policy drivers, key policies that we had. And these are five things that I think could be labeled also as a lessons from Finland or Finnish lessons from my, my own uh, work with this book and um, my international work. I think we need more collaboration and less competition in education. And I'm happy to say this for everybody. I think it doesn't matter how much competition or how much cooperation you have. I see education and running an education system as a business of cooperation, collaboration, networking, and sharing. You know, this is how we are able to respond to these very complicated and complex challenges that our societies and parents and children are putting before us. Okay? That we have to have a system that is uh, allowing and encouraging people to do things uh, in collaboration. Secondly, I think we need more trust and trust-based responsibility before test-based accountability. I have nothing against accountability. Uh, I think it's an important thing, but I think responsibility is more important than accountability. And now for those who think about what is the difference between responsibility and accountability, in, in my book I offer a definition for this. You want to hear this? I'm defining accountability in the following way, that accountability is something that is left when responsibility is subtracted. Yeah? Accountability is something that is left when we take the responsibility away. Okay? And that's why we need accountability, but we need more professional, uh, trust-based uh, responsibility in our school systems. Third one is that we have to invest in professionalism. And I'm, I was very happy to see, I was working here this, uh, uh, in this university and this faculty yesterday and today, that how much this is in the agenda uh, uh, in this country and in this, uh, in this state. And we have to do everything we can to avoid bureaucracy. And this is something that Finns have to listen also carefully because we, our principals, for example, and teachers are seeing more and more things that they have to do. They have to put all sorts of data and things and questions and papers into the data system, and this time is away from their work with other teachers or, or students. So we have to take this bureaucracy uh, seriously. We have to enhance equity by managing choice. And I'm, again, I'm very happy to say this to everybody. But I, I believe, I'm a very strong believer on this, that if we want to have a high-performing education system, we have to somehow take a stance, a position to equity. How much equity are we able politically and technically to allow to people. Yeah? This doesn't mean that we have to abolish everything, that there will be no choice, but we have, somehow we have to have equity, uh, the, the school choice under control. Okay? And the last one is about gender equity. Yeah? Gender equality, actually. Yeah? I think if we had more women in deciding education policies and reforms, we would have not necessarily better policies and reforms, but we would certainly have education policies and reforms that would focus more on well-being, happiness, care, and health of children in the early years, right? What do you think, women? Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah? This is, I have nothing against men. You see, I'm one of them uh, here as well. And I think we have done some great things, but we also sometimes do, uh, overlook some of these important things of of children when it comes to uh, deciding on education policies. I wrote a column last couple of weeks ago to Washington Post about this thing. So if you want to read uh, on my website, you can have this thing. But with this, I um, stop. And I apologize for speaking a little bit too, too much over my time. But you are such a wonderful audience. <laughs> One third of you are sleeping already. <laughs> One third is uh, dreaming about the wine. But when you give me an opportunity to talk about education, uh, I'm going to use it 100%. So thank you so much for this, and I hope to have a conversation outside. With you. Well, I have the good fortune of um, thanking you, Parsi, but I should warn you before I start, I'm a Kiwi. <laughs> Sorry for <laughs> I liked when you put up there the, um, the graph you had about where Finland has gone over the last 30, 40 years and then when Australia's gone. And I think some of you of, of my vintage will remember there's a very simple explanation for that. 
because about 20 to 30 years ago, if you came to this country, before you got off the plane, two men with socks and shorts used to get on, open up all the containers and go down and spray. Now, we were told that was to get rid of all the um, insects and bugs, etc. But it was to get rid of American and English ideas. <laughs> Since we've stopped that, we tend to have adopted many of those ideas, and I think um, what you've shown us today may be at our peril that we have taken up some of those notions. And I find it absolutely intriguing that whilst Australia comes out not too bad in the hierarchy of where all the countries are. I think we're about ninth or tenth overall. But when I actually calculate, as I love to do, effect sizes, it's, it's about a minus 0.4 effect sizes, which is quite ginormous between where you are and where we are, even though we're near the top. Thank goodness we're not Azerbaijan, which is minus 2.53. But we're up there. But what I think you're showing us today is that we actually need quite a game change if we are going to have it. And it's not in the ways as you're saying, the germ notion, but it's looking at, at the equity notion. What intrigues me is why do we have a system that tends to like the germ? Because I could listen, as you've listened tonight, to a very compelling case about equity and about what we should be looking at. But try and run that by most of our systems here. And I have a hunch, my own personal view is that we have um, gone away from what you've explained and seeing the purpose of schooling to make the neighbourhood school the best school in the neighbourhood and how we worry about the education of children. And what we're tending to do is worrying about how we appease the parents about the use of their tax dollars' money, hence the choice or that argument. And I'm always intrigued about why it is that, despite your book, the model society that you are showing us in terms of what you're doing, and uh, sometimes I think that... Um, one thing that our country should learn, a bit like your country, is to amalgamate the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Tourism, because it seems to work very well that way. But why it is that we, we still <laughs> don't want to focus on the matters you've, you're doing? And so my question is, who will listen? But I think tonight, we've all listened. And it's been a, quite a mesmerising uh, story uh, over a tremendous amount of a territory that you've come down to some pretty key messages for us. And we thank you very much for that. And I hope that as you go around both this country and when you hop across the ditch to my country where the story on equity is even worse, I hope someone's listening. And I should warn you, our minister's a female too, so the last line mightn't work there. But the, the notion tonight is how we have been given the story, which is, as a as, as you saw, is a very compelling one. And I hope you will join with me in giving Parsi a big thank you for tonight.